Nick Rowley was an advisor on climate change to former British Prime Minister Tony Blair and has worked closely with Australia's leading authority on climate change, Tim Flannery. Mr Rowley, thank you for joining us tonight. Firstly, we've just heard Julie Bishop there all but rule out climate change discussions at the upcoming G20 meeting. Is she right? Is that an inappropriate forum for those discussions? Uh, well, she almost couldn't be more wrong. Um, if she honestly believes that, then it's really incumbent upon her and anyone else to say quite how a breakthrough is going to be reached at those UNFCC meetings. Essentially what she's saying is that this is an environmental problem, it should be dealt with a UN process, and we really don't think it's something that needs to be addressed by heads of state. It's a very, very particular perspective because if you look at uh, people like Todd Stern, who've been working with Barack Obama all the way through his presidency and was very active in the lead up to the 2009 meeting uh, at, in Copenhagen, Todd Stern is absolutely adamant that in order to create the very momentum required for those UN negotiations, this must be an item on the agenda for heads of state. But the Foreign Minister has flagged that Australia will lead discussions on reducing global subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, which would effectively cut greenhouse gas emissions. Isn't that more than enough? Well, I mean, it's interesting that she should point to that. One of the things that I certainly learned when I worked with Tony Blair through the G8 meeting in 2005, where he didn't just make amorphous subjects like uh, the growth of the global economy. I mean, everybody believes that we need to have a stronger global economy. It's not something that really has terribly much definition. Uh, what Tony Blair did was that he made two key things the priorities for that G8. One was human development in Africa, and the other was achieving progress on the global climate problem. Uh, that uh, Julie Bishop thinks that G20 is going to be the forum which actually deals with fossil fuel subsidies globally is extremely interesting. But in order to do that, as the host of that G20, she and uh, the Prime Minister actually have to demonstrate what they're doing domestically in terms of actually getting rid of the, fuel, uh, the, the very fossil fuel subsidies which support uh, Australia's energy system. Mm. When Prime Minister Tony to Abbott show, visited his... Show, I mean, my, 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 point, my, my point, Oscar, mm. is that it's all very well to raise major issues at international forums, but everybody around those tables in those international forums looks straight at you and says, well, that's fine, I can see why you want to make that a priority. What are you doing in relation to the policies that you yourself can control? OK, when Prime Minister Tony Abbott visited his Canadian counterpart last week, they both dismissed the need to escalate action on climate change, while Barack Obama has called for more emphasis. How can we expect any sort of a consensus when world leaders disagree on even the need to talk about it? Well, it's a very strange position uh, for the Australian government to, to take to uh, the G20 to essentially be an outlier. Um, I mean, who would you rather have as an af a friend if you were really concerned about the strength of the global economy? With all due respect to our Canadian uh, friends, I think you'd probably pick the largest economy in the world, the US, over Canada. Although, of course, we've got a very strong and important relationship with Canada. But really at the heart of this is this bizarre disconnect which still seems to be very much in the minds of the current Australian government between economic growth and measures to reduce the risks of climate change. Now, I've been working on climate change for around about 15 years or so, and anybody who's had any look at the literature, whether it's the Stern Review into the Economics of Climate Change, it's any number of reports from the World Bank, it's statements by Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, or indeed the president of the World Bank, they all recognise that you simply cannot go on an economic growth path which is a high emissions growth path because the costs involved in doing that longer term will be far more significant than the short term costs of actually investing in alternatives to the fossil fuel infrastructure that we currently have. OK, you mentioned Barack Obama's statements there, but it's a bit late in the piece in his presidency, though, isn't it? I mean, isn't it a bit disingenuous that he's chosen to underscore climate change as a, a, an important issue when he's about to leave office anyway? Well, I think, I think you're a little bit early in, in calling, uh, calling the final curtain on Barack Obama's presidency. I think it's one of the very interesting things about having fixed two terms within the US presidency is that once you've won your second term, then you don't actually have to build political capital to go to the next uh, election. You have the ability to really push forward on the agendas that you want to see as part of your legacy. 
And what Barack Obama has been doing there is not making grand statements about all the things that need to happen at international meetings. He's been actually pulling the levers of domestic policy in relation to cleaning up his own energy system through regulation, through the EPA, because he found it impossible to get a carbon pricing system through the Senate. So he's actually taken the reins on himself. He's directly affecting the level of uh, emissions that are going to be coming from their own energy system and he's cleaning up coal. He's doing things. Once you do things domestically over things that you can control, it's then that you have standing at these major international meetings. OK, Nick Rowley in Sydney, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank you, Oscar.